Book Six, Part Two of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Metamorphoses by Publius Ovidius Naso. Translated by Brooks Moore. Book Six, Part Two. All men and women after this event feared to incur Latona's fateful wrath, and worshipped with more zeal the deity, mother of twins. And as it is the way of men to talk of many other things after a strong occurrence, they recalled what other deeds the goddess had performed, and one of them recited this event. "'Twas in the ancient days of long ago, some rustics in the fertile fields of Lycia, heedless, insulted the goddess to their harm. Perhaps you've never heard of this event, because those country clowns were little known. The event was wonderful, but I can vouch the truth of it. I've visited the place, and I have seen the pool of water, where happened the miracle I now relate. My good old father, then advanced in years, and capable of travel, ordered me to fetch some cattle, thoroughbreds, from there, and had secured a Lycian for my guide. As I traversed the pastures with the man, it chanced I saw an ancient altar, grimed with sacrificial ashes, in the midst of a large pool, with sedge and reeds around, a quiver in the breeze. And there my guide stood on the marge, and with an awe-struck voice began to whisper, "'Be propitious, hear my supplications, and forget not me.' and I, observing him, echoed the words, Forget not me, which having done, I turned to him and said, Whose altar can this be? Perhaps a sacred altar of the fauns, or of the naiads, or a native god? To which my guide replied, Young man, such gods may not be worshipped at this altar. She whom once the royal Juno drove away to wander a harsh world, alone permits this altar to be used that goddess whom the wandering isle of Delos, at the time it drifted as the foam, almost refused a refuge. There Latona, as she leaned against a palm-tree, and against the tree most sacred to Minerva, brought forth twins, although their harsh stepmother Juno strove to interfere. And from the island forced to fly by jealous Juno, on her breast she bore her children, twin divinities. At last, outwearied with the toil and parched with thirst, long wandering in those heated days over the arid land of Lycia, where was bred the dire Chimera, at the time her parching breasts were drained, she saw this pool of crystal water, shimmering in the vale. Some countrymen were there to gather reeds and useful osiers, and the bulrush found with sedge in fenny pools. To them approached Latona, and she knelt upon the merge to cool her thirst with some refreshing water. But those clowns forbade her, and the goddess cried, as they so wickedly opposed her need, "'Why do you so resist my bitter thirst? The use of water is the sacred right of all mankind, for nature has not made the sun and air and water for the sole estate of any creature, and to her kind bounty I appeal, although of you I humbly beg the use of it. Not here do I intend to bathe my wearied limbs. I only wish to quench an urgent thirst, for even as I speak my cracking lips and mouth so parched almost deny me words. A drink of water will be like a draught of nectar, giving life, and I shall owe to you the bounty and my life renewed. Ah, let these tender infants, whose weak arms implore you from my bosom, but incline your hearts to pity." And just as she spoke, it chanced the children did stretch out their arms. And who would not be touched to hear such words, as spoken by this goddess, and refuse? But still those clowns persisted in their wrong against the goddess, for they hindered her, and threatened with their foul, abusive tongues to frighten her away, and worse than all, they even muddied with their hands and feet the clear pool, forcing the vile, slimy dregs up from the bottom in a spiteful way, by jumping up and down. Enraged at this, she felt no further thirst nor would she deign to supplicate again. But feeling all the outraged majesty of her high state, she raised her hands to heaven, and exclaimed, For ever may you live in that mud-pool! The curse, as soon as uttered, took effect, and every one of them began to swim beneath the water, and to leap and plunge deep in the pool. Now up they raise their heads, now swim upon the surface, now they squat themselves around the marshy margent, now they plump again down to the chilly deeps and ever and again, with croaking throats, indulge offensive strife upon the banks, or even under water, boom abuse. Their ugly voices cause their bloated necks to puff out, and their widened jaws are made still wider in the venting of their spleen. 
Their backs, so closely fastened to their heads, make them appear as if their shrunken necks have been cut off. Their backbones are dark green, white are their bellies, now their largest part. For ever since that time the foolish frogs muddy their own pools, where they leap and dive. So he related how the clowns were changed to leaping frogs, and after he was through, another told the tale of Marcius in these words. The satyr Marcius, when he played the flute in rivalry against Apollo's lyre, lost that audacious contest, and alas, his life was forfeit, for they had agreed the one who lost should be the victor's prey. And as Apollo punished him, he cried, Ah! why are you now tearing me apart? A flute has not the value of my life. Even as he shrieked out in his agony, his living skin was ripped off from his limbs, till his whole body was a flaming wound, with nerves and veins and viscera exposed. But all the weeping people of that land, and all the fauns and sylvan deities, and all the satyrs, and Olympus his loved pupil, even then renowned in song, and all the nymphs lamented his sad fate, and all the shepherds roaming on the hills, lamented as they tended fleecy flocks and all those falling tears on fruitful earth descended to her deepest veins as dripped the moistening dews, and gathering as a fount, turned upward from her secret winding caves, to issue sparkling in the sun-kissed air, the clearest river in the land of Phrygia, through which it swiftly flows between steep banks down to the sea, and therefore from his name tis called the Marcius to this very day. And after this was told, the people turned and wept for Niobe's loved children dead, and also mourned Amphion, sorrow slain. The Theban people hated Niobe, but Pelops, her own brother, mourned her death, and as he rent his garment and laid bare his white left shoulder, you could see the part composed of ivory. At his birth was all of healthy flesh, but when his father cut his limbs asunder, and the gods restored his life, all parts were rightly joined except part of one shoulder which was wanting. So to serve the purpose of the missing flesh, a piece of ivory was inserted there, making his body by such means complete. End of Book Six, Part Two